aquí. Quiero agradecer mucho toda la ayuda que nos presta la APG. Oh, José Manuel Zamorano ha hablado de ellos a la hora de revisar y de inventar los premios en esta decimoquinta edición y ha sido magnífico el trabajo que, que han hecho ayudarnos a revisar categorías, criterios de evaluación, ponderación de criterios y, y nos han ayudado también a que hoy John esté con, con nosotros. John es autor de, entre otras publicaciones, un libro que se llama Make With, The Emerging Alternative to Western Brands. Eh, John ha sido cofundador y es Head of Strategy de una agencia de Londres muy exitosa eh, que se llama San Lux, San Lux y tiene una amplia experiencia trabajando en Estados Unidos, en Europa, eh, en América del Sur y, y en Asia. Y va a compartir con nosotros casos que eh, invierten mucho en comunicación y casos que invierten menos. Va a ser una, una exposición muy interesante. Eh, John, thank you for being with us. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I'm sure we will all enjoy your presentation. Uh, yes. Hola. Well, that's, yes, that's all of my Spanish. So, <laughs> so. Very sorry. Um, good. I effectiveness awards. I started working in advertising in London in the 1980s and there were no blogs, there was no YouTube, there was very little international sharing of ideas, at least at the level that I was. And the one thing I learned from actually was effectiveness studies. They, they started in London in 1982 and it was the only place you could learn um, the simple question, how does it work? Of course, you learn as a junior planner, you learn, oh, I have to make a target audience or I have to make a proposition, but it doesn't really teach you uh, how it works. You learn how to write a brief, but you learn perhaps later a little bit more overview how business works, how brand works, how society works, and how it all fits together. And I learned even more about how it works when I started to write effectiveness papers and not just read them and I did this in the 1990s and I had some successes and later since then I have written a number of books uh, this is number six uh, that I just finished actually this isn't published I have a publisher which is actually Spanish a very international group and it is out in I think July um, now Very simply, in Spanish terms, actually, last time I was here, I spoke at Alimentaria, the fantastic food festival, and I know, um, I know food in Spain is something that is not necessarily in the UK or America or some other places I've been, and um, I think brands and marketing are like food. It's ultimately a very cultural subject. Um, it's quite universal. Everywhere has food, everywhere has restaurants, everybody has mothers. Who, who cook in a certain way that you remember when you're an adult, and it's a very cultural thing. And it is the same, but it is also very different. If I take you to Tehran and we eat food, then there is no jamón, no alcohol. But still you will recognize many of the rituals and the customs of food. And um, I'm going to be talking about some recipes we heard before, strategy, idea, execution, results. It's very much like cooking. You have a restaurant, you have recipes, you have cooking, the performance in the night, and then you have the food. Um, it's a very similar thing. Um, I think you learn from reading cookbooks. I think you learn from case studies. So all I have today is some stories, very many of which, for brands you never heard of, because they're from, this was my interest, they're from the emerging world, not the developed world, not the West. I'm not here to talk to you about the marketing of iPad, or the next iGenius idea from uh, Apple. And I gave a title two weeks ago, I have a responsibility for a title, which is from Plato, um, Necessity is the Mother of Invention. And I know there's been a lot of controversy and discussion about some of the titles of the uh, conference. Uh, for me, necessity is the key strategy word. Necessity is born out of human needs. Uh, necessity is about truth. That's what Plato meant as much as needs. It's, it's actually about human truth and getting to something true. But there is also a situation, there is something, there is a context which drives it forward. I will talk about some people who've made some brands 
in some countries where they don't have much resources with almost nothing. And I will also talk about some very, very, very expensive big ideas. And it's just a selection of interesting recipes. And I think together, like the cooking, they're a little bit alternative to the way that we cook. I think Spain is much closer to these examples, actually, than America and the Anglo-Saxon model. I think there's something more cultural, but there's more of the tradition left in the brands in, in these countries. Right, the clicker, good, it works. So Jim O'Neill came up with a very famous idea um, in... Um, uh, 2001 called the BRIC economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and he published this, and everybody said, you're crazy, this will, you know, people invest in America, they invest in high tech, the internet was booming, who wants to look at Brazil, Russia, India, China, and of course they have grown, like anything, more than his predictions. 2005, he came up with another idea called the Next Eleven, Pakistan, Nigeria, Indonesia, Turkey, Korea, again, which have grown even faster. Those countries have grown faster uh, than, for instance, China and uh, India in, the, in that recent time. And he said, I'm starting with 9-11, he, he published his paper about the BRIC economies uh, one month after 9-11. Uh, he worked in New York and London and he was very, like everybody, shaken by that. But he said that was the moment when he realized that globalization would not mean Americanization. That actually other cultures will grow, and as they grow, they will bring their own ideas, their own confidence, so in our case, their own way of branding. And we have always seen this. We have seen, for instance, the Japanese since the 1950s, 60s, 70s, bring a very different sensibility to brands. They brought a Sony, a Muji, Isi Meaki. They are like our brands, but they're different, and they have a very charismatic difference that comes out of the Japanese traditions and also their the, the love of futurism and technology and modernity. And so it's more of the same, but there are some very new countries joining this list. Um, here is the funny thing about emerging markets is that we have to stop using that word next year because in 2014, the emerging markets in GDP, according to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, will be bigger than the developed countries. So we need a new term, maybe emerged markets. <laughs> uh, and here is Orhan Panak, he's one of my favorite novelists. He is a Turkish writer who won the Nobel Prize for literature, I think about five, six years ago. And he created a very interesting museum in Istanbul, which is also a book, and the museum and the book are both about these objects of everyday life and, and the way to understand these little trinkets, gift giving, tickets from a, a concert, mementos. And at that time he wrote this, the economic growth we have seen in non-Western countries over the last 10 years is enabling the emergence of a new generation of humanity, both modern and non-Western. And that's the key, that's the key to everything I will show you. It is both modern and non-Western, whose stories I'm sure will soon feature regularly in the literature we read, which they will because they're in my book. Um, now, I start very broad and then we get down to some case examples. So let's start very broad with a very big brand called The West. And The West has a very distinct idea of itself and it is a geography idea. If there is a West, there must be an East. But it's also the West of the Wild West, of America, the frontier. And it really carries forward that idea that we've had in the West since the Renaissance, that there is here and now, there is a frontier, and beyond that there is chaos. And everything is progress. We move into this, this void, this vacuum, and now we move with digital, with sustainability, with all these new themes, with financial services. We're, we're always moving into this new frontier. So we're, we're grounded in the idea of uh, progress and chaos and the future. And outside of this West, there is an East, which somebody called uh, Edward Said wrote about our idea of the East being really the unconscious of the West. If we have things that we haven't incorporated, we leave them in the East. We leave sensuality, femininity, 
or all kinds of ideas that we haven't really made central to the West. Not, you know, we're, we're all multicultural global citizens, but this is just to say where the idea of Western brands comes from. And then with the West, particularly in its American form, you get this idea of the individual hero. This is the way to be on the frontier. This is the Wild West. This is Buffalo Bill's Wild West. This is Star Wars. This is two guys who create a global company. It's all about the individual myth of the hero. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the thing baked into brands like Nike. Just look at these, these Athenian, godlike, Western heroes of achievement of sport. Uh, and there is a very famous book called The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell, which a lot of movies are based on. Movies like The, Way, the Matrix, The Lion's King, and originally George Lucas's Star Wars was based on the idea of the hero's journey, which Joseph Campbell said, this is the universal myth of man. Many other academics have said, no, this is the myth of America. And I read you from two of these academics, Lawrence and Jewett wrote in 1977, there is a community in a harmonious paradise which is threatened by evil. Normal institutions fail to contend with this threat. A selfless superhero emerges to renounce temptations, to carry out a redemptive task aided by fate. His decisive victory restores the community to its paradisical condition. The superhero then recedes into obscurity. Um, which I find hugely ironic. We're going to be looking into the East, but if you look at the picture of George Bush, the formerly um, alcoholic and drug addicted son of a, a great leader who emerged to selflessly rid the world of the axis of evil. And it was all a bit like a cowboy movie, and I think it really is baked into the myths of America, and therefore necessarily into the brands they produce, into the way that we look at, for instance, the heroes of the dot com, the, you know, I'll talk in a moment about brands that come from this culture, but they're about the ego, they're about the hero, they're about the individual. And it becomes interesting when you go into cultures which are not about the ego, about the individual, about uh, the personality, but about something else. So I describe the epitome of a Western brand, and of course there's a great spectrum and scale, but it is the idea of being made by. So here is the social network, which is made by 24-year-olds who became millionaires, and it's all about their authorship. This idea of authorship, uh, I've, I've got the quote in a bit actually, but Foucault said that the quintessential Western idea is the idea of the author. It was the author that gave birth to the West, um, because that was the beginning of humanism, I suppose. Um, here is another famous brand author, Steve Jobs. And it's really interesting how many brands, even if they're apparently consumer brands, have this story behind them that they're made by somebody, they're made by, sometimes by a culture, but often by an individual, a hero. Um, and of course it's not just American, here is Coco Chanel, who was an amazing figure in her own time, who moved fashion from the corsets. She, she was in the time of the suffragettes and feminism and getting the vote and all, all of this, and she created a really new idiom, a new style, a new way of, um, not just fashion, a way of being a woman. And she epitomized this, and she created the world's first global brand, which was Chanel No. 5, before any of the American ones traveled. And it was made by, we still buy it, because it was made by Coco Chanel. Um, so here's the quote I mentioned, Michel Foucault, the French uh, intellectual, said, the coming into being of the notion of the author constitutes the privileged moment of individualization. I could read you the whole quote, but what he says is that all the little changes we've seen in the West are very small compared to one big change, which was the birth of the author, which gave rise to the Western culture, the media culture that we know now. And of course, you could just say, of course, things are authored. Um, until you start to meet cultures where there is really a profound mistrust of the icon. Imagine going to a culture where there were no religious pictures of a mother and her baby, or no pictures of people at all, because they don't trust iconography. Imagine going into a culture that distrusts ego, that starts off talking about the community, the family, and so forth. There, there was very similar, this was part of what Japan brought uh, to, to brands, was this idea of a much more communal society, a much less individual one. 
And, um, and perhaps something that's helpful for us, something that moves away from the narcissism that's always lurking at the edge of things like social media, Andy Warhol's world, where we're all famous for. I, th I think it's really that we're famous for 15 readers, if we have a blog, rather than 15 minutes. But, um, and so, potentially, we move into a world where we like the cooking, we still have brands, but maybe they're made with, rather than made by. And that opens the door to a whole class of things, some of which you'll recognise here, and you'll see examples here, and some of which you'll find quite different, like the lack of ham on and alcohol in some of these cultures. And I worked, actually I was inspired to write this book by working in Brazil with a, uh, with a very uh, successful emerging market brand called Natura Cosmetics, and that was my main client last year, and I thought this is so different, the way they think about brands. But I chose to base this in broadly the Islamic countries, because they are the most anti the individual, the icon, the most opposed to the West. I thought culturally it was most interesting. And also I've been dealing particularly with Turkey for 10 years, and I thought there was a fantastic, creative, strategic story to be told, which isn't recognized. So I went to these kind of places. What these places have in common, uh, except Iran, uh, but Iran is also very big. No, Iran is in the next 11, actually. There's, these countries are, on average, growing in GDP by 6% a year, which means they're doubling every 10 years. It's the same rate as China for the last 15 years. And um, they're very much emerging. They're the engine of those trends I showed you before. And they don't see themselves as the East. You go to Beirut, you go to Istanbul, they all tell you the same story, which is we're the in-between. We are the interland, as I call it. We are in, in, in Istanbul, they say we have a bridge between Asia and Europe, and we're like that. We mix the West and the East, we mix the tradition and the future. We're, we're very much mixing traditions, that's how they see things. They don't see themselves as the East. In Beirut, they say we are the belly button. We are the center, which is a very ancient image in the old Greek towns. They used to have a belly button stone to say we are at the center of the world. And they very much see themselves in the center and drawing on different traditions. And it's this mixing, but it's mixing with commitment. So if I compare in that, you know, planners side by side chart, uh, made by and made with, fundamentally, in psychological terms, they're creating from the self. Now, the self can be the community. A broader sense of meaning can be many things. It could be sustainability, but it's not based on, look at me, I'm the author, I'm clever, which I think is the hidden message of so many uh, advertisements and so many brands. They're based on meaning rather than, I want to be like you, so I have to uh, buy the brand. Uh, they're more subjective than objective. And there is this thing, um, they remix, but there's a lot of remixing in Western culture, but when artists and designers and creatives remix, certainly in my culture, it's a joke. Nothing has any meaning. So the ultimate remix was in Japan in the 1990s. There was a display in the window of a department store, which was a crucified Father Christmas. Um, which was a famous symbol in postmodernism, but you could only make that if both Father Christmas and Christianity mean nothing to you. So it's just symbols, let's put them together, it's funny, it's witty. And so all of that irony is very different when you, I'll show you some examples which are mixed with commitment and a sense of continuity in the new and tradition, but they're not a joke. So it's still mixing, but it's something different. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this, but the key idea, the further you go into the Anglo-Saxon West, is the Cartesian idea of splitting. It is me, not you. It is us and them. It's the basis of most marketing thinking is positioning. This is for this kind of career woman who has this idea about herself, and it's always about splitting and saying, if this is you, then, then do this. And what if you found yourself in a culture where we don't draw these distinctions? It's kind of holistic. This is really what I learned in Brazil. They said, stop bringing your charts with this and this. You know, we, let's talk about how these opposites unite, and they're much more philosophical and broad, and trying to make everything more systems thinking, in a way. Um, so you get to and, a lot of ideas with and, rather than either or. Um, and it's developed with the past. You don't have this break with the past of the frontier. 
where everything is like Star Trek, everything is new, we have no, we have no history. Um, but actually making things with the past and creating something new with the past, which I think is much closer to the Mediterranean countries than the, uh, the American ones. I think probably everything I'm saying can be summarized by one thing, which is the countries that make great food are the ones that in future will make great brands. And I think that's not been the case, maybe for the last 50 years, but I think that's how it's developing. And that's the other thing with this commitment, it's born out of some sense of love. Uh, it's a very big human word, but some sort of love and genuine sense of service for the audience that they deserve better. Some love for the subject, some passion, some fascination. That's what you'd look for in a restaurant, and I think that's increasingly what people look for in brands, is that sense of authenticity that comes with that human emotion of love. So, now I have a diagram. It's a very different diagram. All of my five books previously had a grid, but I couldn't make a grid with this book. I tried and it drove me mad because everything related to everything else. So I ended up with this wonderful network of different strategies that are sort of connected to each other in all sorts of ways, and it spells NW, which is made with. And these are the eight recipes I will show you. That's the rest of my talk, and they are they will seem similar in some cases. You think, well, they have paella, we, you know, we have paella, they have pilaf, and it's sort of you know, similar. And in some cases, they're very different. Uh, they don't have ham on. <laughs> um, and e each one, I've just tried to say in a sentence, what is the strategy? So the strategy here is to ignore Adam Smith and Karl Marx and all that time where we created factory styles of production and go back to the artisanal craft of making things beautifully, the traditional way that things are made, but find a modern system to put that in so that it's relevant, so that it works today, so that it's contemporary, it's not from the market where you buy the old souvenirs, it's for now. And that, that network, now that we have these networks, we don't need to alienate production, we don't need to produce like a factory, we can involve things, people and have things made. Um, a very literal example is Karen Kachekshian uh, in Beirut, who was working for some very famous brands in Italy and working with you know, the top industrial design and she would say, any idea I have in my mind, I sketch it and they can make it like a lessee. You can just make it with these plastic materials and incredible computerized production. Then she moved back to Beirut to be with her family, to be with her home, to be close to the belly button. And she couldn't do this because the only production facilities she had were local craftsmen. And so she gradually taught them to make very, very modern. She had made very modern, very high-end furniture and objects. And so she showed me a tray that she makes, and it's a very beautiful, simple tray. It looks industrial, but it somehow looks warm and human. And she said, the guy who makes these, he used to make the trays for the market, and they have a verse from the Koran and pictures and all this stuff. Took all of that off and left one little wazo, one little bird. And she makes everything like that, and she makes everything with a profound sense of story. She has a whole range called archetypes, where it's about how does this feel in this hand? What, what does this object mean? How do we understand by touching things? It's very conceptual. Everything she makes feels retro, but then you look at it closer and you realize, no, it's something new, I haven't seen this. But she has all these signatures, and it feels warm and human because it's not industrially perfect. She was showing me the line on the table. And so she makes actually very aggressive, very industrial styles with the hand. And it's kind of beautiful what she does, and it is just very... Uh, uh, Good design, but interesting. She said it's because my curse became my blessing. She moved there, she couldn't make things like they made in Italy, so gradually she had to develop something new. Um, PS Lab have done the same thing in the same town, but they're very internationally big and famous. They are the couture of lighting, and many restaurants and galleries and hotels in the world use them, and they do everything they do to make their styles modern and also site-specific. It must be for that place. If they made the lighting for here, it would only be for here. Except, again, they have this artisanal style of production for the same reason as Karen. And they had to really work with their materials. But again, they, worked, they end up with something unique, something very organic, even though it's, again, very, very modern um, 
these were design examples. This um, guy, Matt Timmer, he's like the Steven Spielberg of um, Turkey. He made this series called Magnificent Century. Um, he Basically, he was a commercials director. Uh, there was a big financial crisis in 2001. He lost all of his money. He sat at home by the phone for six months. No one would hire him because he was a competitor. And then he got a job in Turkish TV. And he said, you have to understand Turkish TV, the idea of a TV program, is we have a famous singer who appears in the show, and we have Indian production values. And that's what he couldn't believe it, because he was making commercials, not just for, for Turkey, but for Japan and for America too. A very different style, and he also made cinema. And so he worked and worked up, he made, he's broken all the rating records in Turkey, and then he got enough funding to make what he really wanted, and what he wanted was to make a program about the Ottoman Empire that was as magnificent as that time was, and he is based on a beautiful love story between Suleiman the Magnificent and uh, his wife Roxolana. This has been a hit show in 43 countries. Uh, this caused debates in Saudi Arabia about why Saudi Arabian men are romantic. This really uh, changed lives and marriages. And it was all his vision that you could make Turkish television like he'd made cinema and commercials. And he brought in all of those craftsmen and the technique, a very different type of craft, but he brought in, he was the first to use steady cam. He was the first to use that really cutting edge style of cinema and commercials grading. And he made something that nobody had seen in, in Turkish TV and nobody could believe. I had talked to some of the ad guys in Turkey and they said it was like a black swan. It just came from nowhere. And it started a craze called Ottomania. They have this craze for the Ottoman Empire now and the Prime Minister and everything. They're really, that there was nothing historical at the time. It was purely his instinct that you could make something magnificent in the sense of the craft of production. And he was very canny commercially as well. I've had a lot to tell you the story. And here is somebody um, who made a business that just got... Turkey is one of the hottest internet investment markets in the world. It's where all the American and Swiss and other investors are going because it's growing so fast. And this is one of the stars. They last round of funding, they got $44 million. And what they do is something very necessary, which is they take all of the pain out of dealing with that kebab restaurant up the road because their food is delicious. You don't want Domino's pizza and other stuff, but the guys are late, they're sloppy, they forget your order. So they created an ordering system for independent craftsmen, all the little guys. Now one in seven restaurants in Turkey uses this system. They just got 44 million in investment. They've expanded into Russia and the Middle East and rated as one of the top places in the world. And it's brilliant just how they worked out how to do this, how to take what you want as a food experience, but just modernize it so that it works, and they, they did all of that brilliantly. Um, so that's craft with. Invent with is almost the opposite, which is how do we humanize really ultra new inventions? And I met many things which are very high tech, but they have this real human sense of story embedded in them. And I thought that was interesting actually, but he, I think that probably is the success story of Apple. Is not the technology, it's humanizing the technology, making it pretty in their case. Um, so bringing humanity, story, play, and involvement to new technology. Um, this is the winner of a talent show across the Middle East called um, Stars of Science, and it's an inventor show. It's like one of those singer shows, but it's for people who invent things. And he invented a device to tune an Arabic stringed instrument. He's a musician and an engineer, and it's just beautiful what he's made. Um, and they have many other winners, but they're, I think it's because there's public voting, but they're, they're nearly always great human ideas rather than that's a very clever piece of technology that you can use in that process there that nobody sees. Um, this is a big hit in America. Uh, you'll find this all over things like Wired magazines, little bits. It's, um, Ada Bader, who is a Lebanese artist and technology a technologist, she's an artist that makes things with technology, and she taught in the American uh, communication school, and she taught technology to designers. And from her experience of teaching, she realized that electronics is really intimidating because it's soldering irons, all these little components, logic circuits. So she made something like Lego, 
where it's very sophisticated. You can quite easily make an MP3 player or any, any kind of device, really, with these components, and it's open source, so people are always meant to be making more components. And ironically, it's the first piece of her work to get into the Museum of Modern Art in New York, even though it's a toy, and it retails on Amazon, and it got four million investments, and it's very cute. Um, I met this guy, XC Soslo, this is Sedat, who, this is one of the top five um, internet sites in Turkey. It's the only one which isn't Facebook or eBay or you know Twitter or uh, Twitter isn't in the top five. And it was before Wikipedia, an idea like Wikipedia that's much better than Wikipedia. I think it's just one of the best ideas I've ever seen on the internet. And it started with he wanted to write some blogs. And he was a technologist, he's a very brilliant technologist, he was hired by Microsoft to go to America to work on their core operating system, which is how he escaped national service and being a soldier. And then he had this hobby since the mid-1990s for a site where people can publish articles. And he had one rule, it must be like a dictionary definition. So, for instance, for the Prime Minister of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, there are a thousand comments but they're all defining. In fact, recently he won a court case because there was a definition of another politician which said two words, idiot and bigot. And they won the court case, he told me, because the lawyer said, well, he is an idiot and he is a bigot. And then the judge agreed. But they, it's become this open forum where Turkey talks about politics. And it's all this game, this rule. You can say anything you want, so long as it's like a de dictionary definition. The first ever entry was pick, weird plastic thing you play the guitar with, and that's how it all started. It has uh, about three million contributors. It's unbelievably big. It's the main place where everybody in Turkey talks about everything. But it's just a beautiful, simple idea of um, a very human idea. And at the bottom of the site it says, everything here is untrue. Because he said it's all about learning to have your own opinion. It's not about facts, it's about he thinks this, I think that. It's about really understanding being a citizen. Uh, it's also a lot of them are very funny. Uh, have some translations of the book. This was the, I met many brilliant digital agencies and inventions. This was one I liked called Game of Your Life, where they, the brief was we have a new university. So, that's already, that's a disaster because all the university marketing says, come to our university, here are people who went here who were successful. You know, now they're the prime minister or they're a top scientist or Nobel Prize winners and they, they're new, so they have no case studies. So they created a future case study. It was the first time the Facebook timeline had been used in the future and you use a game, and it says, like here it says, do you want a geek or party? You know, you want to go to the party or the lectures? And from the decisions you make, it generates stories, and then you've got a future CV of how would your life turn out. And people came to pitch. 250,000 people took part in this. They got a number of the top 100 students in Turkey, which they, nobody expected them to do, and it was a big success. And it also said, this is one university which is relevant. You've grown up on digital media. Here is something that understands your world. And you can, but it's one of the classic digital strategy, which is to change the buying process, like Groupon. Just change the way that people buy things like eBay. This is change the way that people choose a university. Adapt with, I can sense from my timing, I'm going to speed up slightly. Adapting is what you would expect, I think, countries in the emerging world to be doing, which is to be adapting the best practice from the West. Um, what interested me was how deeply, like the Japanese concept of re-engineering, how deeply they'd internalized it and were starting really to go past it. But the thing that somebody said to me is, we have, we, we have no, no, and I was saying, do you mean no pride? And he said, no, we have a lot of pride, but we have no qualms. You know, we didn't say 2,000 years ago, well, the Romans have done roads, so we don't do roads. And, you know, with the internet and other things, we adopt them. We can see the value if it hasn't been done here. But then we make it work here, and then they keep going. And then, after a while, we see things that are very new. 
Um, this is the Mall of the uh, Emirates, and I interviewed the person who is the sustainability head for this construction group. I sort of knew that the Middle East was famous for shopping malls. I didn't know that these were some of the greenest buildings in the world. This is one of the only large uh, shopping malls that has a LEED Gold certificate, which is a very high standard of eco-building. And he showed me how they'd taken all the Western standards like LEEDs and then started to develop their own because actually the problem they have, they have endless energy where they are from the sun, from the oil and so forth. They're very diff many difficulties with water and many of the standards were written for places like England and America which are quite wet so they had to change the standards and they've been developing them but they are, this is the centre for world not just building, but town planning in a sustainable way. And, um, but it all came with starting with what are all the best practices, let's get the experts in, and then they develop on. Um, this is a sequence to a group of technologists, all of whom had an interest, and um, business people who had a successful internet career somewhere else that decided there should be an internet sector in Beirut. So basically they built one and they've done it from the ground. They've copied a model from Silicon Valley called Y Combinator, which is an accelerator model, but they've changed the whole process hugely. Uh, the bit that I like is they, they, at every stage of the process they throw huge parties because they realise there isn't a Silicon Valley, so we need to create one and we need to get people together. And if you want to get people together in Beirut, you have to throw the best parties. So they have, they say, the best parties in the region. And very successful in, in developing new models, internet models. Um, this is a similar thing in Jordan uh, called Oasis 500. I like the fact it's got a slide. Uh, this is called the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. And it's really interesting how they, um, there's this sort of humility. They say, well, we have many brilliant engineers and scientists, but they haven't grown up in America and they read in the magazines, but they really don't understand how the dot com world works. And we don't want them to spend 12 or 15 years finding out. So they take them on tours of America. They just go and meet all the big dot coms and they just take the people there. And many of the brilliant people I met have done that journey themselves. They call it the reverse brain drain. The person from Yemex, Betty, had a big career in Silicon Valley, and then he went home and did what he knew how to do. It's not uh, copying, it's just what he was trained to do. This is another example, Marco Foni. Uh, you need to, if any of you run a large company, be very careful about relocating one of your top managers back to their home country. Uh, this was founded by Sina Afra, who was one of the leaders of eBay in Europe. And they said, why don't you base yourself in Istanbul? And a month later, he launched what is rated one of the 100 most exciting web startups in Europe. It just won an award for the best startup in the Middle East. It sells 50,000 items per day. It is a logistical, only somebody who'd run eBay could understand how to build that kind of business for nothing in three or four years. It's the fastest growing company by far in Turkey. And he says that it makes actually eBay look slow. And he knew how to do it. He just hired other people who knew how to do it, and now they've done it. So it was nothing that complicated. And I, but it's the tenacity. This comes back to the necessity thing. I said, how did you build your audience? It's a brilliant model. It has, it's flash sales. It's worked everywhere. But how did you build an audience? There was no fashion online in Turkey. All the e-commerce was men. They were all buying electronics. There were very few women customers. How did you build it? And he said, very simple. We had a team, maybe 50 people, each person went to each person they knew, their parents, their sisters, their friends. They sat with them with a the laptop open and they said, let's join you in the system. No, not later, let's do it now. Now, let's invite your friends. No, not later, I'll help you do it now. And he said that's how they got to their first million customers. Now they're on TV, they're in super brands, you know, they're very much you know, a big advertising company uh, and rated the leading brands in Turkey. But it's just that little bit of grit, that tenacity that says everybody knows about word of mouth, but how many companies do you know that have got their 50 people to reach 50,000 people in that way? Uh, I don't know many, not even in America where they're quite tenacious. Fused with, I come back to this theme of fusion. Um, this is a, another brilliant Turkish writer. What's interesting about her, she writes in Turkish and English. She writes in Turkish, she gets it translated into English, she rewrites in English and she writes back because she says there's some sensibility that comes up from commuting between the two languages 
which is new and which is more universal than either writing in Turkish or English. I think this is an interesting sort of metaphor for the way that these brands are produced. There's very often that kind of process of living abroad. My next example, this was a restaurant I ate in Beirut. I didn't realize it was going to be one of my examples. It's a fusion restaurant, back to my theme. Um, it is, it's called Casablanca, and I thought, oh, okay, it's going to be Moroccan, but no, it's a white house, and it's Casablanca. Uh, it's rated as one of the top restaurants in Beirut, and it is a fusion of Lebanese and Chinese. And in London, that would just be cool, you know, how cool that they're doing that mix. In this case, it's because a Lebanese guy fell in love with a Chinese woman, and for the last 10 years, this food has been his the expression of, you know, their, their marriage, really. And it's, it's what I mean about fusion with commitment. It's not a game for him. He's just trying to make their, their, their union work, and they work it out on food because they love food. Um, I interviewed Serdar Arena, who is the, uh, everybody says, is Turkey's most famous ad man. He's very funny and very brilliant and had many things to say, which I put in the book. And he told me a lot about being, for instance, modern and Muslim, because that was his background, and to be both. He was the guy that basically started showing the real Turkey. He said advertising in Turkey was very pretentious. We try and copy the French or the Italian or the British, but it was nothing like the people you see on the street with the teeth missing and the veil and the people who really buy brands like Pepsi. So he was the one, the person who did that in my market, some people, Dave Trot, who just showed the real Turkey. Part of the real Turkey is this woman, Azra, who was a very famous entertainer. This was a commercial for Pepsi. Um, and it's about these three boys who pop round, and she gives them Pepsi, and she gives them mobile minutes. And the only slightly Turkish twist is that Azra is the most famous transvestite in Turkey. And the running joke is that these boys don't know, and they visit, and it, he, he creates what he calls, his whole philosophy is instant fame. He's one of those types of alpha guys. But he finds these ways of finding the contradictions. So Turkey is just unimaginable to a sort of simple ordered Western mind, because you have, you know, the women in the miniskirts and the veils, and they're often sisters, or it's on a different day. And it, it's this this mix where they go, well, it's and, it's both, it's not one or the other. Um, and he just manages to speak about Turkey. They hired him because they almost just he almost destroyed their brand eight years earlier uh, for a, a Turkish brand called Kola Turka, which took all Pepsi's Mark Kachetsi. So they hired him to bring the Turkish factor. This is Nada Debs, who is a Lebanese, very Islamic designer, you can see a furniture design, but she grew up in Japan and she just gradually worked out how to make things which were both Japanese and Arab and she said again, like the chef, she worked out how to be Japanese. Uh, Arab is very emotional, very de decorative, all this arabesque and these beautiful patterns and Japan is very formal and she's found something in between that's huge, if, if you know anything about the furniture world, she's a very big name because she's found quite something quite unique and universally relevant in the mix. Um, this is about layers of time. I won't go into this. This is a museum in uh, Abu Dhabi. I walked around this. It's now been built, but um, this is an example of where an entire city has been reconstructed. The downtown Beirut, it was destroyed by the civil war. This was literally where the tanks were and it was destroyed. It then became the largest architectural, uh, archaeological dig, dig in the world, because this city has been continuously used for 5,000 years, and all these remains. And now they built the new city around the old archaeology. You can walk along, for instance, if you go through the souk, it is literally on the ground plan of the Roman markets and you can go down some steps and visit a Phoenician harbour. And it's all this idea, the mirror who showed me around, said it's all about layering history. It's you're standing here now, but who stood here then? That street was Roman, that well was a, a well to the start, and we have all this history. And it's a very urgent issue in Beirut because they had this civil war, because they don't have a common identity, and they had to find literally common ground, and they can find us in their history, and that's the... The vision of this is also spectacular with Sahara did and all these, these world-renowned architects working on this. This is a brand I like very much, another furniture brand called uh, Boxer. And what they do is they take something typically like an Eames chair that they found on a skip in Beirut. Um, and then they cover it with all these different fabrics and lots of storytelling. And they make amazing things. And they, they call it the archaeology of the future. 
It's about taking a piece of Ottoman textile, putting next to a Japanese manga, putting next to words and other stuff, and making something new. And again, these have been a big uh, trend since about two years ago when they were the hit of uh, Milan Fashion Week. This is something that's being built uh, at the moment uh, called the Red Sea Astrarium, and it's got this. I love the counterpoint because in America, uh, Umberto Eco, the Italian academic, quote, uh, semiotician, he said that Disneyland exists to make the rest of America look real. <laughs> and so the, the whole concept of a uh, theme park is to be the fantasy, to be more than the real thing. And here there is the opposite. We're going into history um, and into the future. It is an astrarium. It's got a Star Trek thing. It's got all the stuff we're exploring the stars. And you can tour the seven wonders of the ancient world. And lo like Lebanon, it's weaving in the history, the education, lifelong learning, and also having thrilling rides. So I hope that thing goes quite fast or, or something like that. Um, two more. Emerge with, which it feels quite familiar, but I think part of my interest particular interest in, in doing this book came from two years ago when I went to a conference all about Arab Spring and I thought, Christ, I mean, we think we know what social media are for, but they're just changing the world with this in, 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 in the Middle East and really, they really are social media and uh, there are many examples in the book, what I particularly pick up on is actually the use of humour and satire, which is not a new thing that's been happening in protests for a thousand years in Europe, but the way in which jokes and ideas, there's a puppet show in Syria, which is just the funniest thing you'll ever see, but it's the way that they're actually showing the people this is how the system works. And there's a real sort of consciousness, like there was perhaps in Paris in 68, of actually this is what's wrong with the world. And what we're, and it's very much, they don't have a plan for the future, like Occupy don't really have a plan. They just have a lot of problems with their current range of dictators, but use social me media brilliantly and um, in, in a very human way. This was an advertising example in Tunisia. After Ben Ali, the dictator, had gone, they, they did a survey, this NGO did a survey and found that only about 50% of the people were planning to vote. They're just not used to voting, they don't know what voting is. And so the ad agency put up one poster in the port in Tunis of Ben Ali and um, it caused a riot, as intended, it was secretly filmed. People came up and said, no, is he back? And they tore this poster down. And behind that poster was another poster which said, if you don't vote, we could have dictatorship back. And there was, it was a great effect in the study, actually, it won awards at Cannes, but it, the millions of people saw this, it was all over the national news, and they just made a very simple point, and they mostly made it by creating a viral video, which then got them news coverage and so forth. Um, Burak Arakan is a MIT-trained artist who makes art out of networks. He became famous for a three-year study of his own famous, uh, of his own spending patterns on MasterCard, and he created a computer program to predict what he would do, and then this would be updated, and it was in various art galleries. This is a, in a friend's flat, when he returned to Istanbul from MIT, he explored something called Ergenicon, which was this secret shadow government conspiracy, and there was a court document this thick of two and a half thousand pages, and he analyzed what are the connections between the names, and he made a network. And everybody in Istanbul and all the media and everyone went sick because they were trying to find out who is the boss, who was the number one. And he said, there is no number one, it's a network. This is the ideology of the future, this is how it works. You can see, and I'm not trying to say anything, I'm just... And these things here, people were making more connections in the text, it's very interactive. He, he has this vision of uh, really the way that networks are enabling a new type of society, a new type of consciousness, and he just shows the networks. He made a piece this year showing mosques, Republican statues, and shopping malls, because he says these are the three ideologies, and he just maps them, and what are the relationships, and so forth. Where are they? How do they relate to each other? Uh, I did a whole series, or a blogger, in fact, in Indonesia, did a whole series of interviews with me, with this little group of uh, quite young girls, who, in Indonesia, they had a very secular government, uh, Suharto, and then they kicked him out ten years ago, and it became very fashionable, actually, for the young fashionable people to go back to Islamic dress, and this whole range of fashion designers have emerged, and these pictures don't do them justice, but they are, it's like seeing Paris Fashion Week or something, there's things inspired by Bedouin, very catwalk, very um, high fashion and also street fashion, 
And it burst out of nowhere about two years ago because one simple change, they moved from being a Blackberry group, which was this 30 friends, to being on Twitter, and a thousand people joined the first morning, and it just went boom, because this was so relevant to Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, this huge generation of very connected people who were just waiting for something to emerge, and now there are magazines and fashion shows and events and all, all these other brands have developed, but it was just social media enabled this cluster to appear from nowhere. Finally, finding common ground. So in places like Beirut, um, it was sort of like Berlin after the Second World War. There were literally crossing guards and, and, and quarters and people not meeting. And one person who was fed up with that, who's become a famous social entrepreneur, was Muzak, um, Kamal Muzak. And he created a farmer's market. And he was a food writer, he'd been covering the whole country, but he created a farmer's market so that everybody would get into one space. And he said, while we may have totally different religions and totally different ideologies, we give the same biscuits to our children at our celebrations, we cook the same foods, we cook mountain foods in the mountain food, we're basically very similar on food as our meeting point. And this is um, a farmer's market, it doesn't sound like very much, but this is like this huge brand in Lebanon that has four events a week, touring events, schools, education, all this stuff, and it's all about his brand, which is Make Food Not War. And it's a brilliant example of just finding something in common and building on it. Um, another example from Malaysia, this is from a, a singer and video maker called PTO, did this huge thing called Vote. Just trying to bring together the different factions and just say, let's all vote, it doesn't matter who you vote for. And he made a series of films about Malaysia, which all of these things were the biggest viewed things on, in, this was the biggest viewed thing on YouTube in 2011 in that part of the world. And really galvanised new generations to think about politics, to think about getting involved to forget about being Chinese or Malay or Indian or so forth and start to believe, start to believe that there is a place called Malaysia. Um, this is an interview I did with the BBC. The question was, in the middle of the Iraq war, how do you launch a BBC Arabic station? Um, and they did it really well. And this year, at the year I interviewed him, they beat Al Jazeera on trust. And their insight was, they went and interviewed loads of young people across the region, they said, well, we're glued to the conflict, but we're also sick of the conflict. We want to know about entrepreneurship, fashion, jobs, education. There's no room for that news because it's all just about a new bomb on the bus and here, there, and everywhere. So they made that other news, that sort of slower news. That a lot of their programs, it has to be news based, it's not just entertainment or culture, but it's all about what really Arab Spring was about, which is how to get on. These, are, these countries have 60% of the people are under 30, it's very young, bottled up. And they're very interested in their futures, rather like the case study we saw before. And this is somebody who's planning to do something very big across the whole region. It's Fadi Gandor, who was the CEO of Aramex, which is the FedEx of the Middle East. And he has recently stepped down as CEO. And he says that the responsibility of business is to support entrepreneurship. He calls it corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. He said, Ms. you must go into your town, of course, fix the water, fix you know, some local social issues, look at the environment, but your big contribution will be mentoring young people that want to be entrepreneurs, give them facilities, give them experience, get, bring them into the economy. You know, that's, that's, that should be the response of the Middle East to Arab Spring. And because he's like the most famous entrepreneur in uh, the Middle East, he's getting a lot of traction. He's just launched this. This was the speech where he launched it. And uh, I expect it to be quite big, but it's kind of a new idea. I hadn't heard that. I've been to CSR things for 10 years. And he says, you should think, you know, where is the profit that people spend in your shops going to come from if you don't galvanize the local economy? Where is your future talent, your future partners? This is where you should invest. It's, it's a very simple argument that isn't uh, as long a walk as some of the environmental ones. So that was everything I said. I hope in, so, in some way some of those recipes will inspire some people here. That's the point of the talk. And thank you for bearing with me. One last point is that these are the diagrams I grew up in Western marketing. And you just can't analyse or reduce or split these examples in that way. There's something whole about them uh, that comes from being made differently. And there's a whole thing exploring what I call brand geometry that you'll have to read the book to get into, but how one strategy blends into another. And that is plenty. Thank you very much. Okay.